things I do to get good YouTube videos for you, hey? Hi guys, Tap it. hope you're all keeping well. Yes, look at this, it is a beautiful day. Ocean Springs on the south coast of the USA. And apologies, it is a little bit breezy here today. Hurricane Ian is currently battering the southwest coast of Florida, I believe about 600 or so miles away. And I think it's having a knock-on effect in the surrounding area. So hopefully you can hear me okay uh, on the mic right now. But in this video, and, and equally as well, actually, I hope, I hope those guys are okay. I hope it's not too bad for them. But uh, hurricanes are never a good thing, right? So uh, fingers crossed. But in this video, I want to answer the question, if you're in the market for a Mustang in the UK, do you go for the 2.3-litre EcoBoost or do you go for the 5-litre GT? It's not the first time the 2.3 has made it into a Mustang. In the oil crisis back in 1973, Ford put a four-pot from the Pinto in the Mustang, 2.3, obviously to save on fuel costs. So something you've got to consider if you're in the UK, what one do you go for given the current fuel price in the UK? And so hopefully this video will answer that. This one here is a 2.3 litre EcoBoost. It is a rental Mustang. It's the third one we've had, believe it or not, because the first two had the most monumental wheel bearing noise coming from the, the front wheels. I believe it sounded like wheel bearings. Well, it could be some trans bearing or something, but it was absolutely unusable and you could hardly hear yourself talk in the cabin. And speaking to the rental people, apparently it's a bit of a known issue with these things, but this one is good about 12,000 miles on the clock. So we're gonna go out for a drive in and answer the question, which one is the right one for you? Uh, what do you go for if you're considering that UK Mustang? Because there's a right, and of course there is indeed a wrong, I guess, depending on what you want. So let's go for a drive and answer that. The things I do for YouTube content for you guys, hey? I mean, look at this now. So, here I am, sat on the wrong side of the car, driving up the wrong side of the road, just so I can put this video together. Honestly. But I digress, I mean, look at this. Look at this. This is absolutely stunning. And what better way to talk about the Mustang than in the birth country of this car. 1965, this thing's been around since in one guise or another. And we're gonna really look at that question which Mustang is the right one to get if you're in the UK. Now, it should be no secret to you at all that I'm a huge fan of American muscle cars, and there's only one man to thank for that. That is, of course, Michael Knight, working alongside Devon Miles in the hit series Knight Rider, which I absolutely loved. Of course, that was a Pontiac Firebird. A man that talked into his watch, and look at us 40 years later, doing it for real life imitating art or what? Just such a cool car. And when it got its S1 pursuit mode, I was in heaven. And I guess my love for muscle cars really stems from that. And as I said, the Mustang has been around since 1965, that first gem. And some of those generations, some of those cars in that generation, I should say, go for some serious cash now. If you've got a GT350R, a Shelby, uh, a Bullet, something like that, you're talking north of about three million US dollars for one of those bad boys. And of course, the first gen is probably still the most desirable Mustang out there, I'd say. Of course, the, the Gen 2 it starts to get a bit fatter and a bit lazier. So Gen 1, Gen 2, kind of okay. But for me, things start to really fall apart for the Mustang in Gen 3, 1979. So Ford was still making these, but honestly, they kind of forgot to design them. And as a kid, I probably would have thought they were still pretty cool, but the reality is I don't think they stood the test of time very well. And if you look at a Gen 3 and a Gen 4 now, they look really very, very dated in, in my eyes anyway. But, you know, they're still a Mustang. They're still kind of cool and they've still got things going for them. So we've got to answer the question, what are these things like to drive? Well, this is the sixth Gen. We'll come on to what they like to drive because when we got to Gen 5 in 2005, 
things started to look a bit better. I kind of like the design cues once again, kind of getting back to what a Mustang was all about for me, which was very good. And then the next thing was, of course, Gen 6, which is what we're in now. And yeah, what is this like to drive? 2.3 EcoBoost. Well, if you floor it from a standstill, it's good, but kind of a little underwhelming. You can hear there the tires was kind of scrabbling for traction. And that really is a Mustang thing. In fact, it's a muscle car thing. Lots of power, lots of noise, but not necessarily a lot of go forward. That's something muscle cars tend to have in America land. And I don't know what it's all about. It's just striving for more and more power, more and more noise, but not necessarily the ability to go forwards. Um, the more power you throw into something like this, it becomes kind of a law of diminishing returns. So if you look at a sixth gen Mustang, you've got two options really. You've got the, the 2.3 EcoBoost, and then you've got the five liter V8. And a V8 is what a muscle car should really have. Can you kind of see where I'm going with this? All the muscle cars I know and love, they're all V8s. And as soon as you put a 2.3 in a muscle car, you kind of think, is that really the right engine? Now, the thing with muscle cars is they really are designed for long distances up the American freeway. And this car does that pretty darn well. I've done probably about a thousand miles on this trip so far, and it's been super comfortable. It really is very, very comfortable indeed. But just to go back to that law of diminishing returns, you can get Mustang GT500s with north of 600 brake horsepower, and you've seen the competition to this, right? It's probably something along the lines of a Dodge Charger or a Challenger or maybe a Camaro, right? And you get a Hellcat, a Challenger Hellcat with 700 brake horsepower, and all they're doing is ending up in ditches and being crashed and having insurance premiums that go through the roof because the people that drive them, the kids that get in these things, just can't handle the power, right? They just can't handle the power. So they end up having hideous accidents. And I guess this is my point, that yes, you can have muscle cars with just too much power that just become unusable. Now the, the weight bias in a Mustang is actually slightly forward, certainly in this gen anyway. I think it's about 53, 47. There or thereabouts on the weight distribution. And these things, the, the back end really does come alive. The traction breaks in this. It, honestly, it will break, break in this. It's 2.3 kb, it breaks in this. And it just struggles to put the power down the road. In fact, I've read people putting bags of sand, about people putting bags of sand in the boot of their Mustangs, especially during the colder weather, to get the power down onto the road, which is kind of mad if you think about it, having to do that to your car just to get the power down. But it's a real thing, it, people really do it. And that's the thing with muscle cars. Yes, you can have too much noise and too much show and the ability to chew up tires, but it's all about the fun, isn't it? And most cars of this ilk, they spend their time cruising in a straight line down the American highway. They don't really go left or right very much. And that's where this car kind of falls down a little bit. When you start to make turns, you feel its weight, you feel its heft, you feel its inability to kind of, I guess, marry with the road, right? But you've got to ask yourself the question, is it comfortable? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. It soaks up those miles very easily. Now, this car, in terms of the looks, I love it. I think, for me, the Gen 6 is the best looking Mustang. That front end is awesome, really aggressive, really purposeful, and just kind of looks mean and menacing, like it's gonna do something nasty. And that's what it's all about for me, how, how the car kind of looks, how it comes across. And the Mustang has an image, appreciate a bit of a hooligan image in the US, but it has an image and 
that's what it's all about. A car should have a character. A car should have an image. Now, you'll know as well that the Gen 7 Mustang has just been teased. It has just been teased. And honestly, I still prefer the Gen 6. Take time probably to get used to the styling of the, the Gen 7 when you see it out and about, see how it really works. You can see the cues are there, the classic triple tail lights at the back. It's still a Mustang, but still the Gen 6 has it for me. And yeah, they've really kind of captured what a Mustang should be in this gen. So which one should you get? Well, as you know, in the UK, you've got the option of two choices, really. You've got the 2.3 or the 5-litre V8. The 5-litre V8 is north of 400 bhp, and this is about 300-ish bhp, there or thereabouts. And you absolutely shouldn't get this one. I'm just saying that out loud. I've seen a lot of Mustangs in the UK now. They've been around since 2015. There's, you see a lot on the road. It's great. I love seeing them out and about because they always go, cool, they look great when I see one. Um, would I have one? Probably not, unless it was maybe part of a big collection. But yeah, I do see a lot of them out and about. But here's the thing. I only ever see GTs. And I think there's a reason for that because if you are buying a Mustang, you've got to get the V8, you've got to get a GT. Getting the 2.3 EcoBoost is like saving up for a Rolex and getting one with no hands on it. A Nolex, if you will. What is the point? A muscle car needs a V8. And as we move to electrification and really kind of see these things disappear, I think it's going to be hard to keep the appeal of a muscle car. So, what are the modes like in this? What is it like? Let's go back to the drive a little bit more. What's it actually like to drive? So, as I said, a little bit underwhelming. Honestly, yes, it is a little bit underwhelming. You've got different modes to play with on the dash, uh, which is a bit of a pain because you've got to kind of, you can only go one way on these rather flimsy feeling, I don't know if they're plastic or metal, but they feel a bit plasticky. These aircraft type switches on the dash, they kind of look cool. So you've got three modes. You've got normal, you've got sport plus, track, drag, and snow and wet. And it'll let you do things like burnouts, etc. but I'm not gonna film that because that's mean and silly and nasty in the lovely, quaint, relaxing town of Ocean Springs. They wanna start looking like some kind of hooligan. But you do get a V8 sound piped through the speakers. So if I go into Sport Plus, you'll hear that. That is it's fake noise, it's fake engine noise, because we're in a 2.3 here, we're not in a V8. It's trying to sound a bit like a V8, and that noise is coming through the speakers. In Sport Plus, it's a little bit louder, and it just kind of gives you that flavor, that little little nod to a V8. So, so yeah, it's not really that much fun, and it's not gonna open your eyes and blow your mind, this 2.3. collision assist there when I'm about eight miles away from the car in front. So yeah, it's you've got to get the V8. You just have to get the V8. Um, but I have to say that even the V8 is still a little bit slow. Believe me, honestly, it's, it's still got a lazy, cumbersome, slow feel to it. And by today's car standards, it isn't probably the fastest feeling car. I, you know, I want to say maybe even something like a Type R might feel a little bit faster and nippier just because of the way it would handle on the road. The 2.3, I think if you're trying to get from point A to point B on the road, you might be quicker FedExing a bit of mail, honestly. Probably to a certain extent, the V8 as well, but that is not what a Mustang is all about. This is what a Mustang is all about, this now the top down in a Mustang convertible, cruising down the American highway, just feeling like you're enjoying a real bit of Americana. And this car does it beautifully. I don't know if I'd rather be in anything else right now. It just kind of gives you that proper American vibe that you expect and you want out of a car like this. So the Gen 6 Mustang, first one available in the UK in right-hand drive form. Glad they saw sense. One other thing I really like about this car is the steering. The steering feel is spot on. It's not responsive, 
but in normal and sport mode, it's really heavy in a good way, in a good way, because when you are going straight up a highway, you just want that solid sort of straight line, almost keeping its own track, if you like, and it does that beautifully well. So they've really got the steering spot on here, nice and heavy, gives the car a bit of heft, makes it feel like it's a car with a bit of purpose. So well done Ford on that one, absolutely nailed it. Also, this is the convertible version, as you know, not the coupe. The obviously Mustang is available in coupe and hardtop. And the roof mechanism is pretty simple. Uh, very Heath Robinson. It doesn't fold away, it doesn't hide itself. It just sits in that back area behind the rear seats, hides out the way. To get it open, you just gotta unclip this at the front and then it will drop back and then the reverse to put the thing up. Simple and relatively reliable. And I hear these things are pretty reliable. Uh, this, we've had two because of two replacements because of wheel bearing issues that making a horrible noise you're driving along the road. But yeah, as far as I know, reliability of these things is pretty good. The one to get is absolutely the V8. If you're looking at any muscle car, get a V8. I just think a muscle car with anything less isn't tennis. I've got to say too, Ocean Springs is an absolute little gem. What a lovely place. And the people here are so, so friendly. So thanks for being such great hosts. So that is it for this one. Hope we cleared that up. Hope that helped you out a little bit. Do stay safe, stay well. See you on the next one. And I'll see you soon. Bye for now.